Ladies and gentlemen, you are listening to the Vincast Australia's premier wine podcast. I just would like to thank everyone who has supported the podcast thus far, uh, particularly the recent people who have liked the Facebook page, have retweeted some of my tweets, have followed me on Instagram, and, and all around just put out the word about the Vincast. Now, my guest for this uh, week's episode has very generously offered me six bottles of their premium Shiraz wine for me to give away to you, the listener. And you need to listen to the end of the episode where I will explain how you can win one of these bottles. That's very, very easy. So stay tuned. I will uh, I'll tell you all about it at the end. On episode 82 of the Vincast, I chat with Viv Thompson, fourth generation owner and proprietor of Best Great Western in the Grampians region of Victoria. Hello there, Vincasters, and welcome to another episode of The Vincast. My name is James Gersbrook, otherwise known as the Intrepid Wino, and I could not be more excited about this week's episode. But uh, before I talk about that, I would just like to thank everyone who uh, listened to the most recent episodes of The Vincast. It was uh, really fantastic, particularly to have Max Allen on to share not only his story, but also the uh, fantastic uh, philosophies and, and perspectives he has on the Australian wine industry. If you haven't heard that episode, I do highly encourage you to go back and listen to episode 81. Uh, you will not be disappointed, uh, particularly uh, with the more recent uh, discussions about uh, the difference, differences. We're all talking about differences with wine, uh, you know, be between conventional and uh, so-called natural wine. So I felt that uh, Max really did uh, speak very, very uh, passionately and, and intelligently about um, how exciting Australian wine is and why we need to avoid kind of pigeonholing wines into certain categories. Now, my guest for this week, uh, I actually uh, managed to record with him when I went out to visit the winery uh, back in January, uh, is Viv Thompson. The Thompson family have since the 1920s owned Best's uh, the, the best vineyard in Great Western, which is in the Grampians region of Victoria. And uh, this year marks the 150th anniversary of the original establishment of that vineyard. So it was a perfect opportunity for me to go and visit, uh, to see the historic cellars and the vineyard, and also to chat with Viv about his uh, his life and his, and his connection to such an historic uh, part of Australian wine. Uh, so do stick around for the end of the episode where I can um, tell you how you can win a bottle of the Bin Zero Shiraz 2014, which Best have finally uh, offered to me. Uh, I would like to also thank uh, Kathy Lane and Fireworks PR for uh, putting us all together and allowing me the opportunity to, to go and visit and also to sit with Viv. So uh, until then, I'll see you on the other side. Viv, thank you very much for having myself uh, here in uh, picturesque but slightly uh, wet uh, Great Western uh, to to uh, best sellers and, and vineyards. And uh, thank you very much for, for that, making some time for me as well to to sit down and have a chat on the Vincast. It's a pleasure to have you here, particularly as you brought some rain with you because we've been desperately short of rain here for a long, long time. And uh, for our vineyard this year, this is just absolutely fantastic. Bloody fantastic! Well, don't say that Melbourne doesn't <laughs> doesn't give sometimes. Sometimes that's right, but it's uh, no, it's certainly been terribly dry here, and uh, we're running very short of water, and this rain is really welcome. And of course, uh, 2016 is a, a very momentous year, as it's the 150th anniversary uh, for 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 Bests and uh, and you know, the the original vineyard. So uh, I'm I'm really uh, it's a pleasure to kind of be able to to visit in in such an important year. Well, it certainly is a historic year. People have asked me sort of what it means, uh, 150 years, and I don't really know, but every now and then I sort of think back and say, well, that's pretty good. Uh, it's it's one vineyard. Uh, it's been in two families. 
uh, but our family have had it since 1920, which is, uh, you know, once again, a considerable amount of time. But uh, I guess I never thought a lot about it until uh, Bess had their 100 years mm. and then our family had their 100 years and I got to thinking, oh, this is pretty special. And now we're reached 150. It's, it's uh, very special. It's very special. Fantastic. Now, can you remember um, when you were young, um, did you kind of – it was wine – something that was important to you when you were young? Of course, it was the family business, but did it did it sort of sink in at that point that you might want to kind of, you know, how you might want to work in, in the family business, you know, through your life? Well, actually, it was uh, quite opposite. Um, I'd grown up with vineyards and wine all my life and it was all pretty boring stuff and, and uh, I never really appreciated it very much. Just and, work. Uh, it just seemed like work. Yeah, it just you know, it seemed like work. And, and uh, I, I was always very keen on farming and stock and uh, I wanted to, uh, they had to go and buy me a sheep station because there was a lot of money in wool at that stage and uh, that looked pretty good. But uh, I came home, um, worked for a year, saved money, uh, travelled overseas for about two years, mm. um, which was uh, a great turning point in my life I think I matured I grew up I learned a lot about myself because I travel on my own most of the time and um, came home uh, dad was starting to get a bit older and need a bit of a hand so I came home and uh, I met my future wife she must be obeyed and uh, that was <laughs> in, in, end of the story that was it so I settled down and then I became extremely involved in not only the winery but in, in our industry and uh, at that stage, and it still is, it's full of absolutely wonderful people, great, very genuine, solid people. Well, that's one of the thing, the, the, the main reasons I, I enjoy doing my podcast is I get to talk to so many fantastic people involved yeah. in the industry. Um, where did you travel? Where, we, we, was it just travel or were you working as well? Well, I, was, I went through, I went to Ag College actually. Uh, went to Ag College for three years and I went through Ag College with uh, some chaps from, from Kenya in East Africa. Wow. And I went back with one of them and worked there for a year uh, and then went, went on to Europe. And I had some quite, uh, I got introductions to places uh, along the Rhine and also in uh, Burgundy and Bordeaux. And uh, so I, I, I did visit the wine areas there, but I was quite young at that stage. Sure. I think I was about 21 at that stage and pretty young and fairly green. But um, I guess uh, that probably started the the entrance, uh, interest you know, in, in wine in the future. Um, and I saw, yeah, a lot of wonderful old historical places and, and drank uh, some very good wines. But at that stage, I guess I didn't have the education or the knowledge to appreciate them. But I certainly uh, been working on that ever since. But certainly you would have, um, you know, found things that you, you enjoyed and you enjoyed, you know, particular cuisines that you might have had in, in Europe or maybe even in Africa as well. Uh, and, and, and that kind of... I don't know, different kind of way of looking at wine possibly, you know, further down the line might have had an impact on you a little bit? Uh, possibly. I, I guess it did look uh, experience and travel always gives you uh, an inquiring mind. Yeah. Um, and I guess that uh, the more you travel and the more you move around the world, you're more interested to become in a variety of things. And certainly... Um, at that stage, wine was of, of quite large interest, and because I was young and a large appetite, food also was was pretty <laughs> important. So. Of course, um, in terms of the studying of agricultural sciences, do you think that that uh, helped sort of further down the line as far as uh, not just the, the you know the, the vineyard work, but but also you know your your interest in other. Uh, forms of agriculture. Well, it, it did certainly help, but uh, I mean, at that time, my father wanted me to um, do the enology course. Right. Uh, but as I said, I wasn't interested in enology because that was uh, at that stage, uh, wine making was pretty much peasant status, and uh, nobody was making wine. And the, the money only. Uh, I said, if you drink drank wine, you had a bit of, a bit of a problem. Yeah. And I mean, a few of us still got that problem, but in those days, <laughs> it was a, a bit more, uh, a bit more succinct, and. Um, so it wasn't a very glamorous industry at all until the 1960s when, uh, and all that changed and uh, sort of since the early 1960s. Um, it's been a, a great buoyant and a very positive industry. So what do you think it was that happened in the 1960s that kind of changed the, the wine industry in Australia? Look, it's hard to pinpoint it. Um, a lot of people say the, influ 
the influence of uh, many of our migrants coming to Australia, but I don't believe so. I think it was pretty much homeborn. I think uh, the Australian industry decided they wanted to do something, uh, and they started to publicise wine as a better way of life. Right. At that stage, Australia was very buoyant. Uh, we had wool, we had uh, agriculture was, was booming, and people were looking for that better way of life, that better lifestyle, and wine became part of that. Mm. Um, particularly red wine for a start, certainly for the first, uh, I suppose, right through the 60s. It was only until the late 60s and early 70s that our technology changed uh, in the wine industry. I mean, we've got things like refrigeration, we've got stainless steel, we've got better filtration, that people were able to make light, fresh, aromatic white wines. Mm -hmm. And so um, we have the days of Barossa Pearl and uh, uh, Benin Moselle, all these light, fresh, fruity wines, yeah. which gave young people an introduction to wine drinking. Yeah, of course. And I guess that's one of the things I think is lacking today. Um, we're a bit bogged down, a bit stereotyped, um, and for young people who want to drink wine, there's not much of an introduction there. No. Which we certainly had in, in particularly in the 70s and 80s. Yeah, of course. So when you came back and, and you were coming to help your, your father, how did you get, how did you first kind of get more involved in, in the family business? Uh, very simply, yeah. got up early in the morning, worked all day and went to bed <laughs> at night. <laughs> Just worked. It wasn't. It wasn't like I had much choice. Yeah. Um, Everyone had to pitch in. Yeah. I, I, you know. Uh, I mean, you don't come home to a place uh, to a family farm and, and sit in your backside. You've just got in and do, do things, and which is exactly what I did. And at that stage, we had a winery at Lake Boga, and we had the winery here. And um, uh, there's a fair bit of running back and forth, and the Lake Boga winery was pretty important at that stage because. At that stage, also fortified wines were quite important. Yes. And we had a still up there. We were making spirit. Okay. Um, so things were pretty diverse, and uh, there was a fair bit, fair bit going on. That particularly in that, the sixties and seventies. The seventies here was the most exciting time. Sure. Um, everything was happening, and for the first time in our life, we had money. I mean, we'd been struggling, the well ever since we started. Uh, yeah. And uh, there'd never been you know two bob to rub together, but suddenly the sixties coming. We were selling wine like water, and uh, we were getting good prices, and uh, we could afford to uh, put up buildings. We could afford to afford equipment. Uh, we could afford stainless steel buckets. We had all these <laughs> things which we dreamt about before that, and suddenly they were, they were, it was available, and we could afford them. So, so the, um, it quickly changed from becoming just business and just sort of you know fortified wines, you know, spirit, um, to there being a sudden newfound interest in in wine in Australia, and and that probably would have been an exciting time as far as. Was there a lot of collaboration? Did you have people coming to visit and sort of talking, looking at, at stuff and talking about, you know, how you make the wines? And did you travel to, to other wineries and kind of, was it was it very supportive and, and sharing of, of knowledge about, you know, winemaking and stuff like that? Firstly, I mean, while fortified wines are important, here at Great Western we only ever made table wines. Uh, we never made fortified wines here at all, uh, but they were made at Lake Boga. But certainly with the introduction of table wines, um, it brought in a whole new world for us, a whole, you know, people. Uh, and the other thing was that people were very sharing. Um, I travelled a lot in the 60s and, and if we were buying equipment or something like that, I, I'd go, I might go to South Australia or I might go to Rutherby and I, uh, at that stage I wasn't going to Griffith, but Griffith's the most exciting place in the country. I think it's amazing what they do up there. Mm. But um, certainly, and, and the people you went to and, and some of the, I mean, Going back years ago, people like the Henskys, Sue sure. Hensky. Uh, um, if you go to uh, uh, Dean de Bortley, Dean Senior in, in Griffith, mm. uh, the Chambers in Rutherglen, all these people uh, all around Australia uh, were very supportive. The Gramps in South Australia, you know, doesn't matter where you went, people were very, um, we we're all working very hard together to sort of get the wine thing up and going, and uh, we we're very supportive of each other. And ever since I've been in the industry, um, we've always been supportive of each other. Maybe not so much on the marketing side. There's a bit of competition out there. But I'm always surprised how quite often a group of the marketing blokes from different um, uh, companies will get together on a Friday afternoon and have a beer or something like that, which mm. you sort of don't expect. But it's still, I believe, it's still a fairly unified, uh, a unified industry. I don't think there's any industry anywhere which can work together in cooperation like we have done. So was there a certain point where... You, you kind of realised how special 
best was, uh, particularly in terms of you know the age of the the vineyard, and that became kind of a, a a selling point, a talking point, and and people would come and visit to see look look at all these beautiful old vines that they have here. Actually, that's been quite recent. Right, <laughs> I'm getting on a bit now, but it's it, um, it's one of those things you grow up with, you accept it, mm-hmm. and people say, yeah, when did this happen and when did that happen, um, and I, I think. Um, when you think about planning, planning ahead and all this sort of thing, uh, I heard a comment last night. The only reliable thing you can rely on is change. Mm-hmm. And that happens. I mean, you can make all the plans in the world, but change happens. That's, whether, the, whether that's the only constant is change. Whether it's climate or whether the only constant is change, yeah. whether it's climate <laughs> or whether it's government, um, uh, value fashions, your dollar, taste, fashions, yeah. taste. Fashions, tell me about it. You know, Riesling, Sauvignon, Blanc, Chardonnay, away we go, mate. You know, mm. it's, <laughs> it's endless. So can you tell me a little bit about um, the, the original foundation of, of the, the vineyards and, and, you know, what, what was it that brought the family to this area? Short history lesson. Um, the best started here in 1866 planted vines in 1868, which is quite interesting because I assume this country would have been covered in timber at that stage mm. and there's no way in the world they could have prepared a land in two years to plant vines. Yeah, I suspect they could have been working this country 10 years before then, but uh, I believe that the act that allowed people to acquire land came in in about 1866, so they were able to register the land at that stage. Sure. So while they registered the land in 1866... I suspect they've been working it for a long time before that. Otherwise, they would never be ready for planting in 1868. Mm-hmm. But the story is they took up the land in 1866 um, and they um, uh, planted the early vineyards uh, and they planted a lot of vines uh, to start with. You know, when I say a lot of vines, probably 20, 30 acres in the first year or two yeah. um, with a, a, a big uh, mixture of varieties um, which they believed would be good for the area. But... Bearing in mind the experience in this region wasn't particularly big. We had uh, Truett and Blompied in Great Western, uh, Louis Metzger, uh, he was started uh, before that, uh, just around Conconjella re- region. But there wasn't much experience here. And uh, when the best first came, the best, uh, they go right back, they're traced back to the late 1500s. Mm-hmm. And there's pretty amazing stories. But just to give you an idea, they arrived in Hobart, I think it was 1830. And... Um, um, one of the best decided, because they were going to live in uh, Launceston, he decided to walk up to Launceston to organise accommodation because the boat was going, it stopped at Hobart for supplies and it was taking them around to, uh, around to Launceston after that. Yeah. So he walked to Launceston and back. Now think about that. From Hobart? From Hobart. And this is in about 1830. I mean, there were no buses, there were no trains, there wouldn't even been a track, I wouldn't think. So, I mean, <laughs> these are sort of... So, you, you obviously, you, you can't see my face now because it's an audio podcast, <laughs> yeah. but my face is a picture of astonishment. Yeah. And anyway, then they organised where they're going to live and he walked up and walked back again and then they uh, landed in Launceston and they were uh, cabinet makers. Mm. And they were finding it tough there. And one of the reasons they find it tough because of cheap imports coming from the UK, coming from Britain, right. which uh, is not that different today except the cheap imports are coming from other places. Um, but they, they uh, worked in Hobart for a number of years and then um, uh, George Best went across to Melbourne where he took up land. I think he took up 15 acres in Hawthorne. Mm-hmm. He also owned... 15 acres in Hawthorne. Hawthorne, yes. That says a lot about how, <laughs> how Melbourne's grown since then. And uh, they, they had premises, I think, in what is now Burke Street or Collins Street or somewhere. Um, his wife had her eighth child at the age of 54. Whoa. <laughs> so the women are saying about not having children yeah, over 40. Yeah, long before yeah. So uh, anyway, and then... Uh, but the boys, uh, it's uh, Charles and Henry, they decided to go chasing gold at one stage. And they reckon there wasn't there was no future in that, so they um, worked on the sisters' property in uh, the Western District and learned a bit about cattle, about how to you know, handle cattle, slaughter cattle, and then they moved up to uh, Great Western, where they set up slaughter yards mm-hmm. uh, for the miners. They reckon there was more money in making selling meat than uh, than uh, trying to uh, find gold. So uh, they had a butchery there for a number of years, and then. Uh, 
Uh, at that time, Trouette and Blompied had started in Great Western. And this were a French couple, and that's another story on its own. And they had a, a vineyard there, uh, orchards, um, vegetable gardens, which they were selling uh, stuff to the miners. But they were also pretty heavily into vines. And uh, at that stage, there must have been a, quite a demand for wine. So the best saw an opportunity here. So uh, uh, Joseph, um, he took up the land in 1865, and Henry took up the land in 1866. There were two brothers, uh, Joseph and Henry, mm. and that's when they started. They continued on until um, uh, 1920. Um, Joseph died in 1987, and that, that's, he was over where sepals are today, and he, was born, and he died without leaving a will, and that property was sold to uh, Hans Irvine, mm-hmm. who was a Ballarat politician and a man of means and uh, pretty well off. And uh, he was the chap who really started the sparkling wine making. He did a lot with the building of the tunnels and all this sort of thing. And uh, he retired, I think, in 1919 and sold the property to Sepples in 1919. In the meantime, uh, Henry, who founded this place, he died in 1913. His son Charles took over. And um, uh, Charles sold, he wasn't very interested in wine, and he sold the property to my grandfather in 1920. So where, where had your family been before that? Well, we'd been over at uh, Rimney, which is about 12 kilometres sort of southwest of here. We started there in 1893. Yeah. And that was quite interesting because my uh, great-grandfather was a baker and he, ba- he was a baker at the exhibition in Melbourne in 1888 with the Great Exhibition, which I think the exhibition buildings were, were built for. Right, And he was, a, he was a caterer there. Wow. And he, the other thing was he was a temperance caterer. Now, um, I think what you've got to remember... Temp- temperance, a temperance. Temperance, religion. non-alcoholic. Non-alcoholic, yeah. yeah. that's right. So what it, Evil word. <laughs> what, yeah, what, it, what it really meant was, being a temperance caterer, you didn't serve alcohol. And I suppose uh, there might have been other considerations as well, but I don't think my great-grandfather was by any way a teetotaler. No. Because I, I believe that what he... Um, this is just purely my summation is that there was a big wine exhibition uh, at the same time at the, at the, at the exhibition centre. And I think this is my grandfather got sort of somehow involved in that and said, this looks pretty good. Yeah. And within a few years, he'd come up to Rimney, uh, which is quite close, which is in the Great Western region. And um, he, he bought a vineyard there in 1893. And that's how we started. Ah, okay. I often sort of tend to, uh, not so much today, but if you go back into the 70s, 80s, 90s, there were a lot of people getting into wine, buying vineyards, and it was a hobby. Pro- and a professionals. Bit, and yeah, professionals, yeah, yeah. and I was always a bit down on them. Uh, but I think if I look back at my history, maybe that's how we started. <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't know, but I, I, that's just, just I surmise that, you know. But, uh, well, you know I, think, I, I think that possibly part of the influence of people getting into, uh, you know, establishing vineyards and, and wanting to make their own wine as you say, kind of as a hobby, they might have been doctors or lawyers yeah. or teachers or whatever uh, in the 60s and 70s and 80s. It's possible that they kind of tasted some of these older Australian wines and sort of were inspired by that and, and kind of thought, 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 we used to make these amazing, you know, dry table wines in Australia, red wines in particular. You know, I want to, I want to do that or, you know, as well as being influenced by wines they probably would have been drinking from Europe. Uh, and so I think that that was that was an important thing. Like I just recently read um, Campbell Mattinson's um, sort of the true story or, um, of of Maurice O'Shea, yeah. you know, and it's fascinating. Like I, I'm quite interested to kind of find out what it was like, um, you know, in the 1920s. You know, we've just come out of the First World War. We're heading towards Great Depression. You know, it must have been a really really interesting, but also big struggle. Um, to be running a wine business at that sort of time? Well, I think that um, if you look at the history, um, the sort of late 1800s was pretty buoyant. Yeah. Um, this, is, this was sort of like particularly Europe was being affected by phylloxera. Yeah, and vines that's right. Yes. Out. So there that, was a, and, uh, a market for Australian wine. There's another the, story there on the phylloxera the thing, but it was certainly um, – uh, we do like export at that stage from here. I mean, right. we've got old uh, – 
that whole thing where we went to Bombay and it went to uh, San Francisco and we exported to Glasgow. And so the export business was quite good and alive and well, I, I believe, in the late 1800s and probably early 1900s. And this was for, for dry table wine? I assume so, yes, because that's all we made here was dry table wine. Yeah. Although we did have the other property at Rimney. Um, we had that until 1926. Okay. When we were rapidly going broke and had to sell the place. But certainly uh, this place here was purchased in 1920. Uh, my grandfather was a bit of a gambler. I don't say a gambler, but I think he sort a of... A risk taker. A risk taker, yes. <laughs> and uh, from the time he bought this place, uh, things went started to go bad, from bad to worse. Yeah. And uh, I think, I don't think Charles Best was that, didn't have that knowledge what was going to happen in the future, but it was a pretty smart move on his behalf to sell the wine he had when he did in 1920. Because from then on, things just got tougher and tougher and tougher. Kind of like the Rosemount story. Yeah. Sort of. But anyway, it um, yeah, it was a very uh, a very difficult period. And, and how they survived during the 30s and 40s and 50s, I just don't know. Uh, I know we always had debt uh, you know, up to our ears. And it was only until the 60s we got out of debt. And the father was very reluctant to go back, ever go back into debt again. He mm. was very, very careful. And, uh, I mean, he really watched his, his every cent. He watched every cent because he'd been brought up in that very hard period. And um, a bit of that rubbed off on me. Uh, I'm not quite as, well, that tight is not right, the word, as frugal as he was. But uh, certainly I, but when I came into it, I had his history, but I also came at a time when, you know, we had money, we could spend, we could buy things. Yeah. It was, it was quite different. This is like in the, like particularly in the 50s, you know, baby boomer period and that kind of thing. And so there was a sort of, I guess it was probably a, a sense of opportunity. Yes. And, and, and so I guess it probably would have been, you know, all the more rewarding when the market started to evolve a little bit in in favour of the kind of wines that were being I, I, produced here. I'm, I'm not just not too sure as to what re kicked the wine industry off in the '60s, but I, I believe it was uh, almost a fashion thing. You know that you know drink wine was popular and you know drink wine was the thing to do. And uh, uh, I guess it's a little bit like uh, Asia today, where wines are being drunk uh, not because they're wine, but they're drunk. Because it's a, the European influence, sure, and a lot of Asian, <coughs> it's, China, it's, it's very cultured. Yes, yeah, very cultured, and I think that was exactly the same thing that happened here in the sixties. Many apologies for interrupting yet another fascinating Vincast chat, but I just wanted to talk to you about Wine Companion. Wine Companion was established by James Halliday, one of the, if not the most important wine educator and communicator in Australian wine history. Uh, initially as a way to um, keep a, a catalogue of the, the, the Australian wines uh, for the year, uh, giving them ratings and, uh, and also tasting notes. But Wine Companion has more recently evolved. Not only is there a, a regular uh, wine magazine that comes out uh, with articles, tastings uh, and information about uh, wines, but also the Wine Companion website has a huge... Uh, and very deep um, repository of, of information about Australian wineries, vintages, um, tasting notes, reviews, um, uh, also um, you know wine prizes as well. Uh, and as a special guest, uh, gift for listeners of the Vincast, you can get a 30% discount on any of the many subscription packages simply by entering the code INTREPID30, one word, at purchase uh, as um, a way of saying thank you. So thank you very much, Wine Companions, for your support of the Vincast, for your support of the wine producers who appear on the podcast, and thank you, listeners, for your support as well. At what point did you sort of officially take over from your father? I never did officially take over from my father. <laughs> uh, it was, I guess, that as he got older and relinquished responsibility, I picked up the slack. Mm. And the same thing has happened with my own son. Uh, my elder son, Ben, he's now running the place. Uh, he's always been involved with the vineyards, but not so much with the winery, although he has had a bit of winery experience. Uh, but... Once again, I'm finding as I get older, uh, I do less and less, uh, and he's he's picking up the slack behind, or there's somebody else picking up the slack. You and, get to do the fun stuff like be on podcasts. Yeah, <laughs> that's right. Yes, I've done all the fun stuff. But uh, no, it's uh, 
it's one of those evolution. I mean, the thing is, people tend to think that everything is set in concrete and things happen on certain dates. It just doesn't happen that, happen that way. As I said before, the only stable thing is change. And as change comes, um, other change takes place to, to pick up the slack. Mm. I guess that probably uh, f- from the wine side of things, I guess I became fairly involved in the late 60s. Mm-hmm. Uh, from a business side of things, probably not until more into the eighties. Okay. Um, and yeah, I, the, the, my father was he was right here. He was here every day, every work right to the end. And he died in uh, uh, was it like ninety seven. Mm-hmm. Um, but I also pick up a fair bit of slack. I had my uncle also. He was up at Lake Boga, and he was getting older. And um, around that sort of late. 80s period it was pretty difficult because uh, um, I was running had two wineries to run two vineyards to run, uh, run a, and run a business as well and up till the middle 70s I was, I was a winemaker as well mm. um, and that's when Trevor Mast he was our first winemaker he came in 75 so he was the first person that yeah, you employed first, to yeah, kind yeah. of handle that side of the business and I think you mentioned before I, I have mentioned before about the cooperation between people and yeah. certainly I relied on a lot of people for advice and assistance and help and people like Bryce Rankin at the Wine Research Institute in South Australia um, he was a fellow who I relied on quite a lot um, I think a lot of winemakers in Australia yeah, rely on him. yeah he was he was a great fellow to this day and he was my he was my sort of technical, <laughs> technical bloke but people like that um, were of great help and great assistance, mm. and uh, I could, uh, and a lot of individual, not so much help with individual wineries, but you'd go round to people and say, "Well, look, you know, I'm looking at a new press or a new pump. What have you got?" And they'd say, "Well, we got this, this, and this." And by the way, we've got this over here. That's pretty good. You want to get one of those, you know? Yeah, of course. Um, so, and you got all this sort of advice, and there was a lot of cooperation. And also, I guess during the '60s and '70s. There was a lot of influence uh, emphasis on viticulture. Yeah, uh, okay. I mean, I, I always maintain up until the um, uh, probably the late seventies, most winemakers thought that grapes grew on the back of trucks. Yeah. Um, but during that period, uh, there was a lot of influence on viticulture, especially in the seventies, eighties, and into the nineties. Um, I think there's probably less emphasis now, but of course that was during that huge expansion period, and people were. Uh, planting grapes and they wonder what varieties, what irrigation, trellising, all this sort of thing. Mm. And there's an enormous amount of interest in viticulture, particularly in the 70s, 80s. As far as the wines that um, have been made here, at least sort of since you've been involved with it, um, was has it always been that, that, you know, making wines like that's a Riesling, that's Chardonnay, you know, single variety wines? Or ha- has has the wine evolved quite significantly um, I guess, yeah, that's a good question. Um, in my time, um, most of the varieties have been made as single variety. Yeah. But having said that, uh, before my time or in the early 60s, we did do quite a lot of blending. Mm-hmm. Um, but I guess in the 60s and 70s, the focus point became on varietal wines and we pretty well stuck to that. Um, unless in the case of Cabernet where we've blended a bit of Cabernet Franc and Merlot in them, which is your traditional the Bordeaux, Bordeaux blend, blend yeah. and we planted those. But that was that was more in the 80s and 90s. Mm. Um, so, yes, generally speaking, we've concentrated on on varietal wines, yes. And, and do you know if that was something that, that you deliberately chose to do or was it a little bit customers kind of asking for, uh, you know, I, I've, I've tried this Riesling, I'd, like to, I'd yeah. like to have some Riesling, for example? I think it's a bit, you know, which came first, the chicken or the egg? Yeah, uh, And I don't sure, not think I can answer, but, but certainly um, once you start getting involved in winemaking, it's a lot easier uh, to make single varietal wines rather than muck around with, with blending a bit of this, a bit of that, a bit of something else. Yeah. Um, uh, so from a, I mean, Riesling is Riesling. And I guess Chardonnays and Chardonnays. Now you can blend Riesling and Chardonnay if you want to, but it's probably, you're better off with a straight Riesling and a straight Chardonnay. So you must cancel I, the two of them out. Yeah, I, I'm, not, I'm not sure. A good question, and I'm not sure how to answer it. But I think that certainly here, um, 
the demand. Once wine became popular in Australia, which is, say, the 60s, 70s, odd, uh, then varietal wines seem to fit that pattern. And while there's all some blending being done, um, I mean, they did, uh, uh, is there Cabernet Shiraz and all sorts of things, but mostly um, they were all straight varietal wines. Yes. When, when did the bin wine start to get involved? Well, they go back uh, probably to the eight, late 1800s. Right, okay. Uh, it, it used to be, uh, in the old days, called Claret Number no. O. And later on, I'll take you outside and show you a book. It's a merchant's catalogue mm -hmm. printed, I think it's 1911 by Lasters in Sydney. And in that book, they've got, um, there's uh, Lasseter's wines, there's Hardy's, um, I think there's Penfolds, and the wines are categorised in number 0, 1, 2, and 3. Mm -hmm. So you'd have Invalid Port number 2, <laughs> Invalid Port number 3, or you might have Claret number 0, uh, and, and the, the Claret number 0 would be two shillings a bottle, and the Claret number 1 would be one and six a bottle. Mm. So it was used as, uh, look, I, I think what it, the, the, uh, this was an old classification was used. I assume we borrowed from the French, they had Grand Cru, First Cru, Second Cru, yeah. and we just borrowed that. And here, uh, we had our claret number O and our hock number O and our claret number one and our hock number one. And um, they, we've still got some of the old labels here. And that's something which just stayed uh, right up until the uh, 60s and 70s. And then once varietal wines come on the scene, uh, we started putting little neck labels on. We had claret number O, Hermitage. Mm -hmm. Now, Hermitage... Uh, Shiraz was always known as Hermitage in this region. It was also known in the Hunter. It was also known as Hermitage. Yes. And I'm not sure sure anywhere else. But elsewhere it was called Shiraz. But in the Hunter, a Grange Hermitage. Yes, it was Grange Hermitage. Normally in South Australia they use the word Shiraz. Oh. Um, it was a South. Anyway, different areas use different terms. I'm pretty sure Coonawarra, for example, they, they use Shiraz. Yes. But certainly here in the Hunter it was Hermitage, and we only changed that. Um, I think. Around about 1980, right when we went over to, over to Shiraz, and we didn't want to lose the Bino, so we just pulled Shiraz uh, rather than go to Claret number, it was, became Bino. Well, I know that Tabilk went from Claret to Shiraz. Yes, that'll be right. Yes, they, they were they were calling their their Shiraz wines Claret until yeah. the early 80s. I but think. I think that was a great stroke of marketing, which we didn't even know about, because we became known for Claret number O or later on Bino, and people now come in, they don't ask for Shiraz, mm. they ask for Bino, which is which is rather nice when you've created a um, sort of little marketing standard which you didn't even know you were creating, but I guess that's been the story of our life. We're not marketing people, we're, we're grape growers and winemakers, mm. but that was uh, that was rather good. And when did the Thompson family reserve Shiraz well, that, get introduced? That came in, in um, with our centenary in 93. Mm -hmm. So we started in Rimney in 1893, and uh, uh, our first wines we put out in actually didn't come out till '94, and that was actually a '92 which we made uh, for our our centenary. Um, that was produced. We've got a certain amount of 19, um, 1868 plantings, so we used those for our Thompson Centenary Shiraz, which was our first one produced in in. Um, in uh, 1992. Uh, uh, mm -hmm. um, and then we didn't, the wine wasn't good enough in 93, then we made 94, 95, 96, 97. We only make that wine, so it, it was brought out to commemorate our, our centenary. And the first year was called Centenary Shiraz, and after that it was as Thompson Family Shiraz. Now this region is very well known for, uh, for sparkling wines historically. Um, and particularly uh, one of the, what I think is the more important um, sparkling wines is sparkling red wine, sparkling Shiraz. And have, has, has that wine, that kind of wine been made here for a long time as well? No. No, we, um, when Trevor, Trevor Mast first came here, we, um, he was very keen to make sparkling wine. So we made some uh, sparkling white wines called, called Cuvée Concangela. It was just a white sparkling wine, which was quite good. And the thing is about here, we had the three classic varieties. We had Chardonnay, Pinot Muni and Pinot Noir. Mm -hmm. um, and that time also, uh, uh, Tony Jordan was uh, working as consultant here. And um, 
Tony came in and helped us a bit with the sparkling wine. And so we made a bit of white sparkling wine at that stage. I've never been keen on uh, the red sparkling wine, the sparkling <laughs> Shiraz. Um, I, I like the Seppel's sparkling Shiraz, but I like it to be at least 10 years old before I drink it. Yeah. So I've never been much of a fan of it. And uh, when um, uh, Adam Waterwitz was here, uh, I was around the lab, uh, lab one day and he said to me, uh, have a look at this. And he, he poured up some red sparkling wine. He said, what do you think of that? I said, that's pretty bloody good. He said, yeah, well, just as well, just, just as well because that's ours. <laughs> so <laughs> we made that my knowledge, but I'm very happy about it and we're, we're making some now. And the wines are turning out very well and Justin's doing a very good job with it also. Um, one of the uh, really interesting grapevines and wines that are produced here me, for me personally, if you, uh, if people who know me know I, I love Italian grape varieties, is Dolcetto. Yes. Now, <laughs> I am just astonished. I think this is probably some of the oldest dolcetto vines in the world, let alone, of course, in Australia. Um, I'm, I'm just fascinated to find out, you know, how such a, a variety that is still pretty unknown to most wine consumers in Australia ended up here and at the, the best vineyard. We have exactly the same question. <laughs> I, I, I have no idea. I mean, we had a lot of dolcetto. Um, as you come in the driveway... Uh, there's about 12 or 13 acres there, which was originally all Dolcetto. Wow. Um, and it was certainly, I'd say, it was probably the big, biggest single variety we had. Now, the only thing we can come up with is that this is a very frost-prone area. Yeah. And at some stage somewhere, the belief was that Dolcetto tends not to get frost as severely. And I can assure you that was quite wrong. <laughs> because it's very bad frost. Um, it's not a it's not a very suitable uh, variety for this area because what happens with the bunches, the stems tend to senesce. In other words, they die off. It gets during the autumn when it gets can get quite cold here. It gets sort of down you know, tempers around almost down to freezing. Um, the the stems die, and the bunches tend to shrivel. Mm -hmm. So uh, we like to get our dolcetto up at probably. If you can get to 12 by that's fantastic. But quite often, if they start to shrivel, the only way you, you can get, get the sugar level up is to let them shrivel on the vine, which isn't a good thing. Mm. So one of the problems with Dolcetto, we can't get it right proper in this area. And it's like the girl that have, have the little curl. When it's good, it's very, very good. And when it's bad, it's horrid. And uh, uh, our current Dolcetto is a bloody ripper. I mean, Justin's done a great job on that. Um, but uh, it's certainly, it's a bit hit and miss. Mm -hmm. um, I went to Italy years ago. Uh, or first, we had some Italians here, and um, uh, they came from Piedmont. And I went a few years later. I went up to up to see uh, the the vines there, but they were telling me they never bottle it over, uh, now, never drink it over twelve months, and and never uh, bottle it over. They sort of bottle it about six months and never drink it over about twelve months. Mm -hmm. So it's it's a bit like a um, a French Beaujolais. And since then, we've taken pretty much a similar attitude. We're bottling it not that young, but we're bottling it quite a bit younger. Mm -hmm. And uh, we're trying to uh, drink it within a couple of years. And uh, the Dolcetto uh, is, I think that's the way to make Dolcetto is to, you know, as, as they, they do in their home country, um, make it young, bottle it young and drink it young. Mm. Now, of course, you know, we're in an amazing historic location here uh, you know of course your family's owned this estate you know for almost 100 years now but um i know that one of the things that first kind of caught my attention with um with bests was how progressive it was as far as communication you know i remember best was one of the, the great um utilizer of twitter early on in terms of like there was one day when they were everyone was encouraged to drink best wines and share their impressions of it how did how did you feel about um you know the utilization of that kind of technology and communication i'm a dinosaur <laughs> <laughs> i don't understand it uh but uh it seems to be working and uh, this this is all quite new actually uh, a few uh, a few years ago, we, we for the first time, we put on a sales manager. Mm -hmm. And this is my son's doing. He, when he started takeover, he obviously saw we had big holes in, in certain things. And, I mean, we'd never done any really active selling at all. We sort of sold as best we could. And um, among my other roles, apart from being involved with wines and vineyards, was also selling as well, which I was never really good at. Um, and we employed Jonathan Mogg. And Jonathan's been with us a number of years now. And uh, he's brought in a lot of innovations. 
And uh, it's been very successful. We're getting a lot of good feedback. And, uh, uh, but I, I'm, I'm quite positive towards it. I think that uh, uh, we had a chap here a few years ago uh, who was working with us and uh, he was starting into this sort of uh, newer ways of uh, selling things. Uh, but at that stage, it was a bit early and we weren't getting much take up at all. But within a couple of years after that, uh, with John on our board, it's been fantastic. I and mean, we're doing a lot on uh, um, on media now and uh, it's very positive and uh, it has my blessing. <laughs> but don't ask me to know to do anything about it because I, I know well, virtually nothing. I have to say that, you know, you're doing something quite uh, different here by being on this podcast. It's, you know, it's a digital way of communicating. So, uh, you know, I, I, I would say, you know, well done for, <laughs> for Look, being I, I willing to embrace such a, a new concept. From a company's point of view, I believe certainly since I've been involved, um, that we've been always very innovative, mm -hmm. particularly in things like the vineyard, particularly in things like the winery. I mean, latest equipment, latest techniques, latest thinking. Um, I don't say we've been ahead of the pack, but uh, if there's anything out there worth doing and we can afford it, uh, then we've been involved in that. And uh, I think that we've always, technically, we've always remained pretty well up to the mark. Uh, and I think that really all we've done is extend that now to social media. Um, so while the way I the way I think of it is that you've been utilizing technology, the latest technology, to capture tradition, and and I think that in yes. terms of the way, for example, more recently in terms of communication, it's it's never tried to be the cool kid, but it's using the the technology, the way of communicating to share. The story and the and and the, what's important in tradition, I, I would think it's the same thing in terms of the vineyard, in terms in terms of the winery as well. It's not about doing it because it's the new thing. It's about using it intelligently to 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 better express the the history, the tradition, and 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 what this site represents. I think you mentioned before about um, the, my connection to history, and I think probably during this new period, I've become a lot more, I don't say committed, but much more aware of our history. Mm -hmm. you know, I mean, people come in and say, these vineyards, you know, they're only 150 years old. And I was, bloody hell, are they? You know, I said, <laughs> I, I haven't, because you live with them all your life. But we've never pulled them out. We've always looked after and protect them. Um, uh, but I thought, certainly, I think in the last sort of five or 10 years, I've become much more aware mm. of the history in which we had. We've always retained it. Uh, as, as near as feasible. Um, but I don't think my myself has been fully aware of the value of it. Mm. Um, but I, I, just because I've sort of grown up with it, I think Ben uh, is much more aware of it than I have been. Uh, but this is possibly due to uh, the fact that we, we, we've got a few milestones uh, in the way of, of age and time. And... Um, and, and with the social media, uh, certainly made me much more aware of the history and the background which we have. Back in the day, people would have had to come here and, and tell you a story. Of, oh, I had an old <laughs> bottle of Best's wine. It was just wonderful. Now people can just take a photo over their phone and send a tweet and say, you know, ah, oh, like I, I love this wine. You can just have it up on on the computer and sort of say, great, mm -hmm. this person over in 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 America or in, or in you know. The UK, you know, sharing their love of the best wine. Yeah. So I guess, you know, that that's probably an exciting thing. Um, but I guess, yeah, it's really important to kind of to celebrate the tradition and, and the history with the amount that, you know, the Australian wine industry is changing now. There's so much new stuff. I guess this is, uh, I just thought of something else. It's probably only since now that I've taken a backward step and had time to look at these things because a moment, a uh, moment when I was wearing full I didn't have time to do it. Now, now I've got the time to sit back and have a look and say, gee, that's pretty good. Gee, that's old. And <laughs> so it's amazing what you can see when you stand, actually stand back a pace and just have a look what you've got. Yeah. Mm. Well, um, I'm sure there are lots of exciting things happening this year to, to celebrate the, the 150th. Uh, anniversary of, of the of the vineyard um, and I'm sure there'll be you know even more exciting plans in a few more years but uh, I wanted to to say thank you very much for inviting me here today and 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 
sitting down to have a, a discussion about yourself and about the history. Um, so thank you very much, Viv. I really appreciate it. And thank you for coming up and and making us feel worthy of your time and attention, sir. <laughs> thank you very much indeed. This was all mine. Thank you. Thanks again to everyone from BEST, including Viv Thompson, for inviting me to uh, visit uh, the Great Western Cellars and Vineyard. Uh, it was a fascinating opportunity to, to visit such a, a historic place in Australian wine. Of course, you can follow BEST on uh, Twitter, on Instagram. They are BEST Wines. Uh, and on uh, Facebook, it's BEST Wines Great Western. Now, as I promised at the start of the episode, you can win a bottle of the Best Bin O uh, 2014 Shiraz. Uh, the guys at Best have very generously donated some wine for me to give away. Now, the way that you can do it is by sharing this episode. Now, you can uh, tweet about it uh, on Twitter. You can um, share about it on Instagram. You can share it on Facebook. Uh, and um, if, if, if you share the post on Facebook, uh, for every like you get, you'll increase your chances. Uh, for every retweet, retweet you get uh, about the, the podcast episode, you'll increase your chances. For every uh, like you get on Instagram, you'll increase your chances. And you can also increase your chances by leaving a rating on the iTunes store for um, the podcast, The Vincast. Give, give it a five-star rating and leave a review and make sure you include bests in there. But make sure that in all those instances you are tagging uh, the, at, at Intrepid Wino and also at Bests Wines. So, of course, you can follow me on Instagram and Twitter. I'm at Intrepid Wino and the podcast is at The Vincast. Uh, you can follow me on Facebook, facebook.com forward slash Intrepid Wino. Uh, and, of course, uh, you can uh, follow the, the YouTube uh, channel Intrepid Wino where I have um, actually tasted several best wines. Um, if you subscribe to the podcast, it means that you are getting the newest episode as soon as it becomes available. Uh, and of course, I appreciate you leaving a five-star rating and a review. Uh, come to Intrepid Wino. There'll be lots more information about how you can win a bottle of Best Bino Shiraz 2014. Thank you very much for listening to this episode. I hope to have you on future episodes. And why not go back to, and listen to previous episodes of the Vincast as well? But until then, I will... Uh, speak to you soon. Bye.